Hello, Internet. I am Daniel O'Brien, and welcome to another episode of Obsessive Pop Culture Disorder, a show that disassembles the familiar construct of movies and TV shows you grew up loving, and also that one where I talked about Guess Who. If my opponent said, is your character anything other than white, I was out of the game. Boy, remember that? Remember Guess Who? Hey, remember the episode I did about Guess Who? Anyway, today's thing is about... <laughs> Movies have always had their share of overly questionable relationships between characters like Harold and Maude, Richie and Margot from the Royal Tenenbaums, or that time Indiana Jones and his father both had sex with the same Nazi lady in like the same week she fell into a bottomless pit and died. But then, there's the far more subtly screwed up relationships that I'm about to plunk into your face like you're a goddamn wishing well. I hope this first one's about a Disney character. Magic is real! <laughs> Belle, Pocahontas, Cinderella, Snow White, Sleepy Time, Beauty Machine. For decades, Disney has been reinforcing the same message. A person who has no friends but hangs out with animals all the time is just misunderstood and probably better than you. There are varying degrees of human animal relationships in the Disney universe, from Cinderella carrying out complete conversations with mice to Pocahontas regularly chilling with raccoons. The problem isn't that these people are being nice to animals, that's a fine message. The problem is that Disney wants you to think that people who surround themselves exclusively with animals and wildly spoil them aren't insane. Aladdin has spent years living on the streets, sleeping in an abandoned rooftop, tucking a monkey into a bed who was dressed exactly like him. You know what that means? It means Aladdin, who was living on the street and starving, had to squirrel away some money to commission a matching outfit for his monkey. He didn't steal it from the monkey vest shack, because that's not a thing what I just said. He had to hire someone to make this. That tiny monkey outfit is by far the most lavish thing Aladdin owns. He had to go to a guy and hand him money and say, no, I don't want to use this money for food or like sleeves for me. I need some pants and a hat for my goddamn monkey who can't even follow simple orders. Don't touch anything. No! I own a dog and he has three hoodies. And that's probably the worst thing about me. Like, my life is not together. Before I took care of student loan debt or visited a doctor for the first time in like 11 years, I made sure my dog had three hoodies. I live in Los Angeles, it's always warm and anyway he hates them. Same with Cinderella, who sits in a tiny room and vents about her day to mice she dressed up in little outfits, like some kind of death row inmate. She spends every morning getting bathed by birds. Would you let birds go near your, where you, where you keep your female genitalia? Because she does. She lets him, she lets him right up there. Disney characters are heaping bundles of Berkowitz bananas. Disney says, hey, you see that girl reading a sheep? Or that poor guy who's all, yes, the monkey looks like me, so you know we're friends. They're great, they're diamonds in the rough. You should spend all your time with them. I believe that Belle is able to maintain emotional relationships with brooms and clocks and pots because her only other points of contact were sheep and her crazy dad. My counter argument is that that is a bad lesson. That if the whole town thinks a woman is strange, and it is a unanimous belief shared by everyone except some goats that maybe opt to listen to the people instead of the goats. Back in 2009, Avatar made golden cocaine money when everyone in the entire world paid to see it exactly once and then never again for the rest of our lives like the film version of a solar eclipse. The movie opens with a gravelly Jake Sully taking the place of his dead twin brother in the Avatar program, which magically transfers the consciousness of a human controller into the blank bodies of a cloned Navi alien species, quote. And they've grown from human DNA mixed with the DNA of the natives. Everyone on board so far? Jake is beaming his gravelly brain thoughts into a creepy human-alien hybrid that he uses to explore the planet, earn the goodwill of the native people, and then completely betray the cold-hearted corporate army guys harvesting the planet's resources, and by extension his own species, all in the name of getting that sweet hair tail action. The Navi have sex with their hair tails. It's also how they drive horses. The movie was not well thought out, but Zoe Zaldana, I'm in love with you in every single color. And throughout the courtship of Jake and Natiri, the biggest apparent hurdle is him earning the respect of the Navi culture by riding a six-legged horse and a four-winged dragon and a bigger four-winged dragon. That's all it took to hump wildly under the tree of souls while all the glow-in-the-dark seed sprites watch or join in or whatever. Which is strange, considering that Jake is also biologically a bankrupt shell of Natiri species. And they've grown from human DNA mixed with the DNA of the native. Here's the weird part. The Navi know that Jake is an alien from a distant world beaming his thoughts into a hastily constructed decoy body. It's not like he tricked them into thinking he was one of their distant cousins who'd been studying abroad or something. They knew he was a human inside a thing that looks like them. It's the three children stacked on top of each other in a trench coat model of social infiltration. His body is one that can just and shut down and sit around and be stored somewhere when his brain isn't in it. It's a body that, for all they know, is physically unable to eat or poop or produce a half-human offspring that won't flop around in violent conflict with the planet's atmosphere. The movie ends with the happily ever after, where Jake Sully stays in Avatar forever and just, like, is one somehow. Is that not weird? Would no one ever ask, 
hey, what's your body made of? Is it because they know the answer is, oh, some blood, carbon, and the corpse of someone you used to know, probably? I bet that's why. Here's Ron Weasley. He has a pet rat named Scabbers. Because of a complicated web of wizard-related shenanigans and murder, Scabbers is actually a grown man named Peter Pettigrew who was disguised as a rat. He lived this disguise as a rat who belonged to an idiot for 12 freaking years. 12 years of sleeping next to a little boy who eventually goes through puberty all around you. And he just has to sit there and be like, I'm a rat, everything's normal to me. When Peter fully reveals himself, it's insane that he just picks up where he left off as an evil guy. It's insane that he didn't immediately say, I wanna get back into being evil again real soon. But first of all, Ron, you, you're weird and you never shut up and like obviously I've seen you masturbate so I know what face you make and it's bad and wrong and I hated being your rat I hated being your rat and Ron would be like oh no rat you were a piece of shit old man this whole time why did you let me put you in my pocket what else in my life is secretly an old man being a wizard is so stressful remember Peter Pettigrew isn't pretending to be a rat for some weird sexual thrill if anything he turned himself into scabbers because he was a panicked coward that needed to hide in a flash and keep tabs on the wizard world then he spent the next 12 years present for every intimate moment of Ron's transformation from a smudge faced child to a post pubescent werewolf hunting wizard and yes that would inevitably mean he was around for some unspeakable late night moments I'm sure Ron didn't want to share with a 35 year old man pretending to be a rat from then on Ron would never trust another animal again at the end of the series when he's married to Hermione and has kids of his own you know they're never gonna have a family pet. Every time his kids bring it up, Ron just gets distant and weird. <laughs> Karate Kid taught us that if you want to overcome a bully, your best bet is spending afternoons doing yard work in tight shorts for an aged man you met in a maintenance room. Right away, there's an entire filing cabinet's worth of reasons why Daniel and Mr. Miyagi, Miyagi. Daniel and Mr. Miyagi would look like a Liberace servant love tryst to the untrained eye. Obviously, that's not the case. The reality being that Dan needed guidance in a time where a father figure was absent and his mother was too busy keeping them afloat financially. It's just that when you watch these films back to back, you start to notice a few things. Firstly, that they chronologically take place immediately after each other. Ah, smog. Smells like home, huh, Mr. Miyagi? <laughs> in Karate Kid 3, Macho Macho declares that it's been a year since the first tournament in the original film. Let's face it, it's another year, it's a year later, I'm a lot more experienced, right? After that, he spent a portion of his college money to travel with Miyagi to his native country to defend his honor. Very expensive ticket. Well, no, 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 I got the money out of my savings account, it's all taken care of. Saved a kid from a hurricane, and then flew back at the beginning of Karate Kid 3. He spent a year almost exclusively under the supervision of this strange man. His only other companionship being the fleeting relationships he has with girls along the way, none of which end well. <laughs> Smokes! Kamiko from Karate Kid 2 gets KO'd by a dude dressed like Scorpion and still doesn't end up with Daniel for her troubles. In Karate Kid 3, while she moves to Tokyo, Daniel flies back home and gives up even more of his college tuition in order to buy a bonsai shop for his weird old buddy. You can interpret that as really pure and sweet if you want because Miyagi did help Danny out a whole lot after all. But this is his college tuition which means he's a high school senior, which means he doesn't know anything and shouldn't be put in charge of financial decisions of this magnitude. Savings for college education. Wait, so I'll get a job when we get back and I'll go six months later. It really doesn't make a difference when I go. Think of it this way. If you had a child who had money saved for college that you busted your ass to get and they said, I'm gonna skip college for a while and use all this money to buy a shop for my boyfriend or girlfriend to encourage their hobby, you'd throw out flags immediately. You'd say, you're an idiot child and statistically this relationship will not last and you should go to college and get an education and broaden your horizons. There are plenty of other boys and girls in college. Samyagi, you're more important than college. Go to college, daniel son. I'm sure there'll be plenty of old Japanese men there to hang out with. I'm guessing they recast Daniel as Hilary Swank in the fourth one after some producer realized there was no non-creepy way to progress that story. And somehow, this is still not the weirdest man-boy relationship to come out of the 80s. We've talked a lot about Back to the Future in the past, since these films basically exist like a purgatorial Russian nesting doll that gets more and more grotesque every shell you feverishly remove. And now here's another layer gone. Watch this, watch this. Hey, Let's take a moment to get inside Doc Brown's head during this scene, and the decision to test the DeLorean for the first time by driving it at 88 miles per hour directly at him and Marty. First question, does this provide a better vantage point for Marty's video camera? No, it does not do that thing, and actually hinders the clarity of the test compared to shooting it from a safe distance. Second question, does driving the time machine directly toward them ensue Doc Brown's instantaneous death if the experiment fails? Th yep, 
That's the thing this does. This means that Doc was betting his and Marty's life that this experiment would work. Only every time we see Doc in these films, he's continually established as a failed scientist. I finally invent something that works! It's less that Doc was betting his life on the DeLorean, and more that he was one more failure away from suicide, and by God, was he gonna take this vibrant young man with him. What's this? What's this? If I'm right, you're gonna see some serious shit! If I'm wrong, we'll both be f***ing dead, and no one will know why. I know it's the 80s, when everyone was less health conscious, but I'm pretty sure that's still attempted murder. Especially considering that Doc had never tested his time machine before. So even if it worked, there's a million timing and distance variables Doc is failing to consider by conducting his test like a bullfight. Statistically speaking, the following day's headline should have read, Old man and teenage boy killed by dog driving car. Imagine that awkward funeral. Jennifer crying her eyes out. Marty's mom would be all like, We told him not to hang out with that wiry garage dwelling man. Huey Lewis doesn't show up because he didn't actually have any affection for Marty. Seriously, what kind of relationship did Marty have with Doc before this movie, where meeting in a mall parking lot at one in the morning didn't seem weird? The movie paints all the finger-wagging teachers and parents as these killjoy villains telling Marty not to hang out with his best friend, but his best friend is a 70-year-old lunatic recluse who lives behind a Burger King and is actively trying to murder him for personal gain. His only friend other than Marty is his dog, which, newsflash, should have been your first clue this guy was unstable, full circle! All right, I think we're all set with this one. Tune in next, whenever, when our episode will be... Another one about... guess who? What more could I possibly have to say? Do you have ginormous teeth? <laughs> Do you have glasses? No. Wait, what the hell happened to guess who? Why is it all vertical and electronic? Just, you flip the... Why is there pizzas and a frog now? That's absurd. You can't play guess who with pizzas and a frog. All your opponent would have to say is, are you pizzas and or a frog? All right, fuck it, let's do this. Bye. Hey everybody, thank you very much for watching this. Uh, click down here to subscribe and click here to watch more videos if you want. Uh, and if you like this video, for every like that this video gets, I, I will, will put nothing in this pig. I won't do, nothing about my life will change in any significant way.